Hello, welcome to Bite Size Med. This video is on how the kidney handles calcium and phosphate. In the plasma, calcium is in different forms. Most of it is free ionized calcium, around 50%. The rest is bound, either to anions like phosphate and citrate, or to plasma proteins like albumin, that's 10% and 40%. Those that are bound to plasma proteins cannot cross the capillary membrane, and so are non-diffusible. Thus, they cannot be filtered by the capillaries in the kidney. The rest can cross capillaries, making them diffusible forms. They can be filtered by the glomerulus of the kidneys, around 60%. Of that 60%, which can be filtered by the kidneys, most of it, Around 99% gets reabsorbed, leaving only about 1% to be excreted in the urine. The main route of calcium excretion in the body is the GI system. The kidney makes up a smaller amount. However, the kidney is important as it can be regulated. Regulation of calcium is important to maintain homeostasis. So calcium gets filtered by the glomerulus then gets reabsorbed and excreted by the renal tubules. There is no secretion of calcium by the kidney. Once filtered, where does calcium get reabsorbed from? Its pattern is actually similar to sodium. Most of the calcium gets reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, around 65%. The next is in the loop of Henle, the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle, that's 25-50%. to 50%. And the last is in the distal convoluted tubule, that's around 8-10%, to 10 leaving 1% for excretion by the kidney. That's three important parts of the renal tubule. The proximal tubule, the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle, and the distal convoluted tubule. First, let's look at the PCT, where most of the calcium gets reabsorbed. Here we have a cell of the proximal tubule. This would be the tubular lumen with the tubular fluid from where we're going to be reabsorbing calcium. And here we have blood in capillaries where that calcium is going to go. Between the cell and the capillary is the interstitial fluid. So we'll take away that capillary for now to make it look a little simpler. This would be the apical membrane and this is the basolateral membrane. In the proximal convoluted tubule, calcium reabsorption is coupled with sodium and water. Most of the reabsorption happens paracellularly. There are two ways in which calcium gets reabsorbed in the nephron, the paracellular path and the transcellular path. The paracellular pathway is between the cells and moves in along with water. Most calcium in the proximal tubule is reabsorbed by the paracellular pathway. A smaller portion is transcellular. As we move along the nephron in the different parts, paracellular absorption reduces and transcellular absorption increases. Transcellular means it's going through the cell. That would require channels and transporters. There are calcium channels, which allow calcium to enter the cell along its electrochemical gradient. That's how diffusion happens, along an electrochemical gradient, higher concentration to lower concentration, and for positive ions like calcium, from more positivity to less positivity. Here in the proximal tubule, the lumen has a higher calcium concentration, and for the electro part of the gradient, the inside of the cell is more negative than the lumen. The lumen is more positive compared to the interior of the cell, and this gradient moves calcium into the cell. That calcium is then pumped out of the cell by active transport, and it's eventually going to enter circulation. There are two important transporters. The first is a calcium ATPase pump. This is a plasma membrane calcium ATPase pump. It uses ATP for energy to move calcium against its gradient. The second is a sodium calcium exchanger, which literally does just that. It exchanges sodium for calcium. So transcellularly, calcium has been taken up from the tubular fluid and has been reabsorbed. 25 to 50% of the remaining calcium gets reabsorbed in the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. This part of the nephron has a sodium potassium 2 chloride co-transporter, which sends those ions into the cell. 
Here, calcium travels by the paracellular path, so that's between the cells, and also the transcellular path, similar to what we saw in the proximal tubule. But this path is regulated by the parathyroid hormone versus the proximal tubule, which is not under hormonal control. So the proximal tubule calcium reabsorption is not regulated by PTH versus the thick ascending limb, which is. As is the last part of the nephron, where around 8 to 10 percent of the remaining filtered load of calcium gets reabsorbed. Now, here in the distal tubule, calcium gets reabsorbed only transcellularly. There are epithelial calcium channels that take calcium into the cell. Then, that calcium ATPase pump and the sodium calcium exchanger can pump it out into the interstitial fluid. The remaining 1 percent of calcium gets excreted in the urine. The distal convoluted tubule may be handling a very small amount of calcium, but it too is regulated by the parathyroid hormone, making it important. So what does PTH do? The parathyroid hormone is a calcium regulating hormone. It responds to low plasma calcium levels. Low calcium increases PTH release. It senses it with its calcium sensing receptor, and on the kidney, it increases calcium reabsorption in order to fix that low calcium. Remember, it only acts on the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle and the distal convoluted tubule. It does not act on the proximal tubule. It acts via cyclic AMP. ATH binds to its receptor, which is coupled with a G protein that activates adenylyl cyclase, converting ATP to cyclic AMP. This then activates protein kinase A, and that goes on to phosphorylate proteins, and that's how it executes its actions, which is to increase calcium reabsorption. But to keep it simple, using cyclic AMP as a second messenger, PTH increases the reabsorption of calcium in the kidney. The kidney can regulate calcium directly too. When the plasma calcium levels are high, it reduces calcium reabsorption. This is via a calcium sensing receptor, like in the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Remember that it's got a sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter. If that transporter were to be inhibited, that would change the potential difference between the cell and the tubular lumen, which was the driving force for calcium. So when high calcium binds to the calcium sensing receptor via multiple G proteins, this transporter gets inhibited and calcium reabsorption reduces. This receptor is also present in the proximal tubule. So one factor that can increase calcium reabsorption and thus reduce its excretion would be the parathyroid hormone, high PTH. The other is low plasma calcium. Another hormone that shows up in calcium regulation is vitamin D. Now, its main action is in the intestines, but in the kidney, vitamin D can stimulate the synthesis of calcium binding proteins. And when they bind calcium in the cell, they buffer it. That lowers how much free calcium is in the cell, encouraging that gradient to help the cell take up more calcium. Vitamin D thus increases calcium reabsorption, just like the parathyroid hormone. Remember that calcium and sodium are coupled for reabsorption, especially in the proximal tubule. So if there's an increase in sodium reabsorption, there is an increase in calcium reabsorption. Like when the ECF volume decreases, or if there's low arterial pressure, there will be an increase in sodium and water reabsorption, and hence increased calcium reabsorption. The pH of blood can also change what happens. Hydrogen ions and calcium ions compete for binding to plasma proteins like albumin. Remember the third category of calcium. So if more hydrogen ions bind to albumin, that's less space for calcium, increasing the amount of filterable calcium. High hydrogen ions. So this happens when the pH is acidic. The reverse would happen when the blood pH is high and hydrogen ions are low. More calcium is bound, lowering free calcium. And thus when the pH is high in blood, the kidney reabsorbs more calcium. The last one I want to include is plasma phosphate. Calcium and phosphate go together. What happens to one affects the other. For example, when the plasma phosphate increases, it can stimulate the parathyroid hormone. And what does PTH do? It increases phosphate excretion. 
but it also increases calcium reabsorption, reducing calcium excretion. For how the kidney handles phosphates, I'm just going to highlight some key points that you'll need to know. Just like calcium, only the diffusible phosphates, that's ionized phosphate and those that form anion complexes, can be filtered by the kidney, not those bound to plasma proteins. That's around 90% that gets filtered. Most of the reabsorption happens in the proximal tubule, around 80%. 10% is in the distal tubule, and 10% gets excreted. The reabsorption is by sodium inorganic phosphate co-transporters on the apical membrane. They reabsorb different forms of phosphate along with sodium. What's special about phosphate handling is that it's actually similar to glucose handling. The transporters can get saturated. The transporters reach their transport maximum and they stop reabsorbing phosphate when the plasma phosphate levels increase. But unlike glucose, which has to actually reach a much higher level above normal before those transporters reach their maximum, a small increase in phosphate above normal is enough for these transporters to reach their maximum and for phosphate to overflow and spill into the urine. Phosphate reabsorption and excretion is also regulated by PTH, but the effect is the opposite. BTH removes these sodium phosphate co-transporters, so phosphate reabsorption reduces, meaning BTH increases phosphate excretion. It does this again by using cyclic AMP as a second messenger. But here with phosphate, BTH works on the proximal tubule, unlike with calcium. BTH changes what happens to both calcium and phosphate. For phosphate, PTH acts on the proximal tubule and the distal tubule, reducing phosphate reabsorption and increasing its excretion. While for calcium, PTH acts on the loop of Henle and the distal tubule, increasing calcium reabsorption and reducing its excretion. It does not work on the proximal tubule for calcium. Vitamin D, on the other hand, upregulates these transporters increasing phosphate reabsorption and thus reducing its excretion. For calcium, both PTH and vitamin D increase calcium reabsorption and so reduce its excretion. They differ in their effects on phosphate. Vitamin D increases phosphate reabsorption, reducing its excretion, and PTH reduces phosphate reabsorption and increases its excretion. It's easier just to remember the effects on reabsorption and work out how that'll affect excretion. Vitamin D increases both calcium and phosphate reabsorption. It likes both of them. BTH increases calcium reabsorption and reduces phosphate reabsorption. It loves calcium and hates phosphate. That's how I remember it. And that's some stuff about how the kidney handles calcium and phosphate. I hope this video was helpful. If it was, you can give it a like and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.